My name is Chris. Um, I, I worked at Amazon for eight and a half years uh, designing Kindles. Um, so I was there just as this one came out um, and left just uh, before the last one I worked on, the Kindle Oasis, was released. Um, yeah, my background is in mechanical design. Um, so I was responsible for architecting and developing a lot of these products. Um, yeah, so you know, if you have questions about e-ink devices, about the Kindle, about Amazon, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, I think Will and Tobias from Instrumental are going to help uh, kind of ask some questions along the way. And Kyle from iFixit, you're welcome to to interrogate me uh, on the reasons. Just going to critique your screwdriver skills. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to point out that I do have the iFixit official. Hey, design. look at that. Um, it is an iFixit, uh, I believe, kit. Yeah. Um, and I definitely needed that for the teardown that I'm going to, that I, that I so did. I, I've got an entertaining story for you with that screwdriver. Uh, sure. That's, uh, so it's the, we, our screwdrivers are all metal. That one has some rubber gaskets around it. Yeah. Uh, we had someone who was on a hospital ship off the coast of Africa. And uh, the IT guy got knocked on the door and, and they were like, hey, do you have any Torx, you know, T-whatever screwdrivers, at their, their security? And it turned out they were doing surgery and they would needed to remove a plate from someone's head and it had one of these security Torx screws. <laughs> and they needed a screwdriver that they could sanitize. Oh, my gosh. And it had to be metal, right? They couldn't sanitize a plastic driver. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, it worked. <laughs> got the off. Saving lives. Yeah. Well, uh, I just um, want to highlight for people in the session that uh, if you've been asking questions on the event chat all day, in this session there is a separate chat yes. uh, in the right side of the screen where you can go and post questions just for Chris. So uh, Tobias and I will be looking there and read out any questions you guys write there at any time. Feel free to ask and we'll, we'll make sure Chris gets them. Um, so I first wanted to share, I actually, uh, I cheated a little bit and I actually did the teardown uh, before we started, but uh, uh, because this product was actually quite challenging to tear down. Um, so I have a little uh, time-lapse video that <laughs> actually shows what happened as I try to do this. So I use the, uh, I try to use the iFixit uh, eye opener to tear this apart, but essentially there is a lot of adhesive holding this display down. Um, and uh, what we are tearing down right now is the Kindle Oasis. Um, this is the latest generation, I think the flagship device that Amazon sells for their uh, e-reader uh, line. Um, you see, I already broke the display, trying to unglue some of these things, and I took out some of the components. Uh, once you get the display off, it's actually relatively simple. But getting the display off was quite challenging. Um, so you know, that's. <laughs> That's one of the uh, things that I did. I spent a lot, a lot longer than I, I expected to taking this apart. I didn't actually work on this product, but I was there when it was still sort of in concept. Um, and, uh, you know, I was really impressed with the way they were able to get that out. Um, now I'm going to switch back to the overhead camera view, which actually will show you some of the live uh live video so we get we get kindles from the electronics recyclers and we take them apart where we can and if we yep. can get the screen off without breaking it we'll sell it as a replacement screen and okay. so how successful we are totally depends by model uh with yes. kind of how it was designed it's true um the i'm gonna move this here so i don't pull off myself um yeah, so the original Kindles and actually a lot of the, I think I had the Kindle 2, which is the first one that I was there for the entire development, and then the Kindle 3. Um, these were actually very simple to take apart. Um, yeah. The screens were, were easy to access. Uh, at the same time, there were some challenges. You can see this one actually has a broken display. Um, the drivers were very difficult, were very easy to uh, to uh, break. So So the the displays themselves were quite fragile. At the same time, there was no touchscreen layers. There was no other, you know, there's, you can still see there's a keyboard on a lot of these. Um, try and get the focus there. Um, there's a keyboard and there's no, you know, five-way navigation in terms of how, how products were uh, accessed. And this was at the same time that the iPhone had been released. 
So, you know, like technology was moving forward and, and, you know, we were still on like a sort of using a proxy of where your finger would be by using these like navigation, like this one has a wheel, like tells you where to go and you have to click on something to like try and navigate. Uh, so it was kind of uh, clunky. And so, uh, you know, uh, clearly they wanted to get to a touchscreen device, which is this was the first touchscreen Kindle, the Kindle Touch, uh, which used an IR touch sensor on the front. Um, and that was, I was telling Tobias earlier, to, pre pre uh, to preserve the great display that the e-ink Kindles do have, um, to, to put that display surface as close to the, sur uh, as close to the front as possible. Normally, uh, touch screen devices have like a capacitive touch layer on the front and, uh, and then maybe a cover lens or something else. And that uh, makes the display and the, the the text on the page actually appear a little bit further away from 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 people, and so, uh, well, that's a, I see a question here. What are some tips and tricks to successfully remove screens that have strong adhesive? Kyle, do you have some better tips, maybe? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, heat, right? I mean, you're you're hoping that it's a a heat sensitive adhesive heat, and then very careful application all the way around. So you've got those guitar picks there, and that's generally what we'll use. So that strategy where you saw. In his uh, in his time lapse, where you have like ten guitar picks and you put them all the way around the edge, because you have to you have to separate it, but not too much, uh, and get all the way around and have the adhesive not reseal on you behind it. And so just a lot of guitar picks. Um, uh, I appreciate Chris using I fix it guitar picks. There's nothing special about our guitar picks. Any <laughs> just fine. I actually had to use something even thinner because the the gap around the edge was so tight uh, that yeah. I needed to use something even finer to get underneath. Yeah, um, and you can use a razor blade or yeah. Uh, so I used like a little. I think I had like a pizza cutting wheel type thing. Um, Chris, you were talking uh, question. You were talking about the differences and how easy the different Kindle models were to open. Yes. What were the the primary uh, the primary drivers? Was it uh, I know you mentioned some differences in the display. Were there different adhesives, different mm -hmm. gaps? Like, what were the biggest differences that made it possible to to take them off versus uh, like the most recent one that just broke when you tried to pry it off? <laughs> so um, I think, well, I'll start with the first Kindle. The first Kindle kind of is a mess. There's, it was kind of a the first time Amazon had ever designed anything, and it I'm trying to get it in the center of the frame had this removable back cover. And then a lot of screws and other things to access it. Um, and you know, I think speaking to Kyle, you know, you had the removable battery, the SD card slot, a lot of really interesting uh, things. Mostly because they didn't know what this product would ultimately be. You know, it has the keyboard, so you can you can enter in text. Um, the second generation, we wanted to refine this. I think at at the time, this was one of the thinnest. Uh, products like consumer products out there at like nine millimeters and now um, and so you know the idea to remove screws and we started getting more into cosmetics um, it kind of drove the design to be smaller and smaller and thinner and thinner and so you had to start making some sacrifices so you had the ability to screw things together before start some things were not able to be done that way um, and then uh, some of it is also in cost. Like we had a very large board before. Uh, I can actually, this one is very easy to open. There's like two, well, let me see. Can, I really like the metal back on that one. What, they went to plastic after that. The metal back just felt quality. Yes. Uh, this was, you know, it was, I would say it was iPhone inspired um, at the time. Uh, uh, the first iPhone had come out recently and we had, uh, yeah, we wanted to do an aluminum back. It uh, didn't, didn't end up being aluminum. It was actually magnesium and painted, but it was. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah, so it was. Uh, it was flammable. <laughs> yes. Um, but you see, we had like a, a really large board. And, you know, I've taken this apart many times and it, it comes back together, which is great. Uh, at the same time, the reliability on these products was not quite uh, as good as you would like um, because, you know, all the components are kind of held together by screws and not necessarily by some stronger adhesives or something that, that you see today, um, it didn't perform quite as well in some of the drop events. And so you would see uh, results like this on the display, which results in some repairs and some returns. Um, and so you would go to something with a, you know, with a deeper bezel 
would help, but that was less preferable to our customers. Uh, and ultimately, you would get something with like a flush front display where you really need to actually adhere the cover lens down. And so uh, as the generations have gone along, they've the devices have become more reliable. And you know, this first Kindle still works, meaning that almost all of the devices that um, Amazon puts out there, the, the Kindles actually last for years. Um, and so we needed to balance that. Um, you know, how do you make it pass your reliability tests against how do you design for repairability? How do you design for rework in the field uh, and in the, in the factory? Um, but yeah, so I'm going to actually get down to the, I wanted to show two other things that were really interesting about um, the Kindle evolution before I get into the actual teardown. The first, I'm going to remove some stuff here. The first is so just to recap on that last point, Chris, yeah. you're saying that um, as you went away from screws and used more adhesives to bind everything together, that actually helps the lifetime of the product and the reliability. Yes, uh, it, it helps pass certain uh, traumatic reliability events. So like a drop test, a ball drop test, um, certain uh, certain other uh, reliability and, and if you're trying to do like waterproofing for instance it's very difficult to do that uh, consistently well on a larger product um, with just a gasket or or physical barriers alone and so the uh, well, reworkable physical barriers I should say um, gotcha so as we look towards the new generations they're harder to take apart but uh, they, would you say they're also more robust they are they should be more robust yes um, and you know, I think that's a trade-off that a lot of manufacturers are making. And, and to Kyle's point earlier from the session, it is it is a challenge. And I think people are going to have to strike that right balance. Yeah. So, like Microsoft was able to to find a to strike a balance in their in their laptop by uh, reducing some of the more, I guess, unreworkable components. Yeah, um, it's it's definitely it is. E I mean, it's going to be more if you if you take two designs, you put in the same amount of effort, it's going to be more durable if you glue it in. Uh, there's sort of the next level of design capability, which is can you make it repairable and durable? Uh, and that's hard. I mean, I build furniture, uh, and it's always easier to make my furniture durable for the first few years if I just glue every joint together, right? <laughs> it's going to feel rock solid. It's going to feel great. But at some point, someone's going to push on a leg too hard. It pops the glue, and now and now I'm in trouble. So uh, yeah, it, it, you think about like Japanese craftsmanship with a joinery, right? That is really going to that's going to last thousands of years it's going to be super serviceable uh it's durable it's, it's very hard to make <laughs> it takes a, a whole nother level of craftsmanship and i think that's what we'll have to see yeah i, I agree i think there's going to be the right balance that we'll we'll start to see i wanted to show one other thing which is um the evolution of packaging this is the first kindle box and it's you know like a gift box almost i, I can't even fit it into my screen here um but for reference here's my hand um and you know, if I look at on the width here, this is also my hand. Um, and then we got to the uh, Kindle Oasis. This was the first version of the Kindle Oasis. Um, you know, it's pretty compact compared compare these two things. I can barely get that first one on the screen. Um, and then this is the second version of the Kindle Oasis, which is slightly larger in X and Y, but it's actually much smaller in Z. Um, and I did the I did some quick calculations. This, this is actually half the volume of this last one, which is also if I put these next to each other here, I don't know if you can even see that. This you know you could probably put like I don't know maybe ten of these into the original yeah. packaging. So if you're talking about saving, uh, reducing waste and reducing well, cost, just the carbon impact of shipping that via air, it's just dramatically better. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so now you can ship a lot more of these per carton. You know, you're saving logistics costs. You're saving, uh, you know, waste to the landfill as well. Um, and you know, people tend to throw out the packaging, except maybe on Apple products, but they tend to throw out the packaging. Yeah. Um, That's so a really interesting uh, thing to highlight across the generations because I remember at Apple, the more robust you make the product the less robust the packaging needs to be to protect it. So That's iPhones, cool. while they have beautiful packaging, um, the phone itself can survive a drop. So the packaging can be pretty simple. But when you start to go to like laptops, which can't be dropped as much, or even an iMac, the packaging becomes part of the product and needs to be engineered to protect it. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, I think uh, 
when I was there, we were talking about these kinds of ship in their own container kind of packaging, but we were very worried about the the actual like the display itself because that was one of the most vulnerable points. Um, so here's that same device that I I had torn down before, and um, I you know because I already opened it, I can actually show <laughs> do this instead of taking an hour. I can open this in a second. Um, and so this is this is the main architecture. Is there's a single um, actually what, let me see. There's a single um, kind of unibody construction, and I'll show you on a on a separate Kindle here. Um, this is a single metal back with a cover lens, and so there's really two main components of this architecture: this display, and uh, and the housing. And the housing stores all the guts. One of the really unique things about the Kindle Oasis is how thin this section is, right? This is basically just display and housing. Um, and because of that, this is you know, the, one of the smallest devices you could, you could possibly make for a, a reader display. And it gets to that goal that Amazon has of making a magic sheet of paper. Um, all the guts are obviously contained in this bump section. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is, this is really, sleek design and, and it's you know deserves its premium pricing because of how challenging I think it was to build. Um, inside you can see that there is uh, there was adhesive around the perimeter um, and also in the center of this. Um, and, and that's an interesting choice because you know normally a display stack there's some tolerances and so you have different uh, tolerance build up here a tolerance stack. Um, and you don't really want to over constrain this by having adhesive on one side uh, at, a, at one surface and then adhesive on another side. Um, but they compensate for that by using, I think, like a foam material or a really thicker adhesive in one section uh, in order to make sure that it, uh, it could compress enough to account for some of those tolerances. On this display itself, there's actually a number of interesting things you can see in here, which is uh, because this is a waterproof Kindle, the first one that was waterproof. Uh, they had to seal around the connectors. They had to seal any exposed components. Uh, and this display actually has three layers, which is the cover cover lens, or actually four layers, the cover lens, the touch section, the front light. Unlike a typical LCD, this has a front light, which uh, uh, embeds a layer in between the display and the cover lens uh, to transmit light, unlike a backlight, which comes behind the display and shines through it. Um, so, so that push, pushes the display even further back from, from, where, uh, from where the uh, customer sees it. Um, and each of those layers has you know, some electronics. So the touch layer has something that needs to be connected. Uh, and so there's like glue around that. Uh, there's glue around where the, the front light sits, uh, and all of this is to make this waterproof. One other, uh, you know, uh, fun thing here is this is there's a, uh, I believe this is an RFID tag, which is used to help track the display. There's very few places on an all metal back that you can use that are RF transparent, uh, and so this is one area that they did it in front of the display. Uh, Manufacturing. Yeah, so, uh, during manufacturing, and also like uh, you can scan it from above once it's assembled, so you can, uh, you know, associate it with a certain serial number, or when you get it back. Well, you and yeah, so it. that's one thing I'm curious about. The Kindle, as far as I know, was really the first product that came. Like when you got it in the box, you were already logged in. How much of a challenge was that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Amazon's logistics is one of the best in the world, right? So because we know. Who we're shipping something to? If if it, if you've already registered for it, um, they can just scan either the box, which should have the serial number, or uh, if necessary, they could scan through the uh, through the packaging and just get the RFID uh, label, and then would associate that immediately with your account. I, I mean, still, you know, a decade later, that still blows me away. Really cool innovation. <laughs> yeah, I think it's. I, I think Amazon pays a lot of attention to that customer experience in 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 a lot of ways that people take for granted now, uh, but are quite challenging. Um, another couple of things I, I wanna point out, I don't know if you can see in this, and maybe I'll bring up a picture later, um, but there are, this product does a sort of, has an ambient light sensor to help um, adjust, auto adjust the front light. A lot of products have this. 
But because of the design of this product, uh, this product is made to be used either one-handed, either with your right hand like this or flipped upside down your left hand like this. And so where could you put the ambient light sensor that would uh, allow for uh, you know, either reading condition uh, to, to actually work effectively? Um, and it's a challenge because you know, if you block uh, one side of this Kindle, you would want to put it up here. If you do the other side, then you would you would actually block it. So what they did, they actually have two ambient light sensors, one above this button, one below this button. Um, they don't want to put it on this side because you know there's no electronic, there's no space to put it across there. Uh, so that was something that you know they're they're putting in this device twice as many uh, ambient light sensors as you would normally find on a, on a electronics product. I yeah, I had a question, Chris. Chris, back on your your glue topic. Yeah. So you mentioned, uh, if you take off the display for a second, uh, you mentioned there was glue around the perimeter attaching to the display to the housing, Yep. Uh, which makes sense. You mentioned this was a, a waterproof device. And then I believe is in that center right region and that thin region is that black part in the middle that was also uh, that was also an extra area of glue to attach to the back of the display. Yes. So this is where I destroyed the display that was held on. <laughs> so there's a section here that I think if I had used the eye opener properly and placed it there, probably would have been able to uh, uh, kind of maybe floss my way through it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, there's a thick section of adhesive here, this uh, like top hat sized uh, cutout. I'm trying to put that in the middle. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's interesting. Was that... Um, I'm guessing the primary purpose of that was not waterproofing, and that was more just like structural rigidity yeah. for the display. Do, do you know any details on that? Absolutely. So the Kindle, as I mentioned, the Kindle display, the e-ink display, is, uh, was always one of the most um, fragile components in the device. And because unlike a typical LCD, like an iPad or an iPhone, um, where the backlight kind of helps protect the display. The display backplane is actually like a very, this is a piece of glass, right? That sits at the very edge and would, would normally sit inside your housing. And so to increase the torsional rigidity of something that's really like three to four millimeters thick here, you needed to attach that um, to increase the, the structural rigidity of the, of the product here. Um, so yes, uh, I think Amazon has trended more towards this sort of adhere everything uh, simply because of, especially in this product, the design of, 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 the, of the housing um, and what they're trying to accomplish with like showing you how small and thin and light it can be. Um, so yeah, let's, let's uh, move on from this a little bit. Uh, I, one other thing I wanted to point out is there's actually a lot of magnets in this product. Um, so there's a lot of uh, I don't know if you can see them, but there's like little sets of magnets and they usually come in pairs just to make the magnetic attachment points a little bit stronger. But there's points here, 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 and then in the center, you will see some more as well. Um, also, there's magnets on the corner here. Um, and I think, Kyle, you'd probably hate this, but these are actually glued on. They, they were actually adhered to the display, but when yeah. the display finally attached to the device, there's additional glue uh, that actually blocks it or locks it onto the actual, this, this uh, metal sheet. I mean, the magnets glued to a metal substrate is okay. Uh, Cause that'll, that'll get pulled off in the metal fraction when it's shredded. Well, the problem is they were originally adhered to the display and then they're actually yeah. like kind of hot melt glued or some other kind of like set, almost like an epoxy, I think. And they prevented me from actually unscrewing these two. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so I took apart all the rest of the screws on this to reveal the board, but I actually had to pry this open and I destroyed it. Um, you'll see there's some interesting things on the back here. There's actually like some silicon glue that was used to help waterproof the battery. There's actually a really interesting uh, piece of copper tape here, probably to improve the grounding performance. And that's not something that you typically want to do, but is likely something that was forced upon you once uh, you know, the antenna performance was, was created. So these are ways that a lot of engineers and a lot of uh, companies are forced to improve their products 
uh, performance, uh, but come at a cost because this is you know hard to rework. It's hard to take apart, um, and makes it a little more costly because copper tape isn't cheap. Um, I want Chris. Can you tell us a, a little more about you know what leads to an engineer saying, "Oh, I need to slap some copper tape on there," <laughs> other than for the pretty shiny colors? Yeah. So I mean, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of tests that go on, especially on Wi-Fi and 3 and 4G connected products and 5G connected products, uh, where there's uh, electromechanical interference or electric, I guess, uh, electromagnetic interference um, with your with your antennas. Uh, and basically what you're creating with this product being very, uh, or this component being over a battery, which is basically a, an aluminum pouch, uh, is that there's a uh, a large capacitance that can be created with two metal plates kind of very close to each other. So you actually see there's uh, this display is also like a big metal surface as well. And so there's actually uh, a conductive adhesive between this display um, and it kind of runs across this metal. There's a, I don't know if you can see, but there's like a slightly different color here. This has been etched down and there's another component, another part here that has a slightly different color that's also been etched. Uh, so you're basically trying to ground everything together so it's all at the same, uh, uh, I guess the same, well, it's, it's, it's grounded together, right? And it's not just, you can't just connect it at one point, you need to have local grounds because uh, when you're talking about 5G and 4G antennas, uh, they're oscillating at such high frequencies that they couldn't induce um, different kinds of, uh, reactions in in the in the metal and, and impede your antenna performance. Uh, so yeah, so once I opened this and I showed you some of the waterproofing components, Amazon went uh, pretty heavy onto like silicon glue and uh, uh, and other kind of potting methods to to prevent water ingress into sensitive areas like the battery, uh, the power button or the power button, the USB connector. Um, put the little, little closer there. Um, and so, you know, I think that makes it more challenging and it's something that, uh, you know, if they got it wrong or if they put the glue too early before they attach the battery, uh, you know, it might not function and then they'd have to throw a lot of this stuff away, which is very unfortunate. So this is where, you know, companies like Instrumental have really interesting ways of seeing, you know, inside your product to make sure that the product actually can function properly, that you applied the glue properly before you assembled the rest of the components. Um, let's see, what else is here? Uh, so this battery is glued down, and I think part of the com part of the reason is to improve the structure because this is a uh, this would be a large hole in the in the in this cavity here, and if the battery was separate, uh, could if you if you twisted the product enough, you might be able to damage the display by you know kinking this. Have you run the numbers? Because there's a lot of different strengths of adhesives that you could use, but, right? Like, I, and I think that I don't know, I, I don't know what your experience was removing that battery, but you can use a relatively lightweight adhesive and still get that right, still get that structural rigidity. Yeah, I think the challenge is like, as you mentioned, uh, was heat, right? Uh, we used to run this test that would uh, destroy <laughs> a previous version of the Kindle, which was which we called the dashboard test. And the dashboard test is when you're uh, basically imagine leaving your Kindle on the dashboard of a car in uh, Arizona in the middle of summer. Um, and so the temperature inside the car gets up to 140, maybe 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and it can kind of melt things apart. Um, and so, you know, at that point, you could theoretically, uh, it could loosen some of the adhesive. And we're talking about like pressure sensitive adhesive. So you really need to apply pressure to get the uh, adhesive to stick to the, to the, uh, between the battery and, and the uh, housing. Um, and so I think if you, we, we tried to do some things in the past, at least when I was there with a slightly less, um, less tacky adhesive. But what we found was in that uh, crazy test, after we do that and then we would drop it, the batteries would come separate, uh, would separate. And so there is a there is a fine line between, you know, going too hard and making it yeah. possible, like the Galaxy phones that you took apart. Uh, right. But also, you know, I think we do want to be able to take these apart just because it's 
Right. Otherwise, you can't get anything else out of the product. You could do a combination. You could have, you know, you could have the adhesive to get you the rigidity, but then you could also use a frame with screws and have the screws continue to apply pressure. So if it unglued, there'd be pressure to re-glue it back. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think the other side of that is like we use every 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 millimeter yeah. to get this battery as big as yep. it was. Um, if that's a million power. I know it's it's challenging. Um, one thing I actually wanted to point out with this battery was this battery is a 1,000 milliamp hour battery. Um, if you know anything about uh, devices uh, like iPhones and other things today, they, I think the iPhone 12 is like a 2,800 milliamp hour battery. Um, and, you know, it lasts for, what, like a day, maybe a day and a half. Uh, this is This is rated to last for six weeks. So ink displays are much lower power. Um, and this, you know, this is uh, one of the benefits uh, of, of building with uh, building e-ink devices is that you can reduce the size of the battery. You don't need it to be much more than 1,000 to, to 1,500 milliamp hours. Um, and, you know, I think the original Kindles actually had larger batteries, like 1,500, maybe even up to 1,700 milliamp hour batteries. So that's come down and the battery life has kind of stayed about the same, if not increased, uh, due to increased efficiencies. Um, yeah, so I don't know how much more time we have. We probably keep going through this, but uh, if anyone we has said, any questions. Yeah, I would say let's get a uh, quick plug to post to any questions in the session chat. Yeah. Again, so over on the right, if you go into the session in the chat, um, would love to hear from some of the other people here. Uh, I had I had another question, Chris, while we waited. Yeah. Um, so I noticed uh, you mentioned we've got the glue again back to the waterproofing because that's always the hot topic. Sure. Um, we've got the glue on the exterior as uh, kind of the first barrier defense, but you also have these gaskets around the connectors and you mentioned, I think you mentioned some additional potting uh, around yeah. certain critical components. Uh, what was, do you have any more, uh, any more background there on, did you guys ever try to do just an exterior seal or were there other ingress points um, other orifices that you had to have these internal connector seals as as backup. Yeah, I mean, I think if you if you look at this product, really there are four points of entry, maybe five. Uh, one is around the display perimeter, which you use adhesive to block. Another is uh, at the at the page turn buttons here, which uh, you can see here they've actually. Uh, created, uh, I'm not sure what you can quite see, but there's actually like a, a separate glued on component that kind of shields everything. And then the, the FPC that goes across it is actually also like potted and glued in place. Uh, then you have the USB connector and also the LED indicator because this is a, um, this is an aluminum housing. They had to actually micro drill uh, some, or maybe laser drilled some holes. Um, and so that one actually has, there's a little interesting component in there. If I can get my, I fix it tweezers out. There's actually a very tiny little gasket underneath here, which they use, I think to, I can't quite get it. Okay. Wait. I don't know if you can quite see this, but there's like a little rubber gasket here that they use mm -hmm. to seal it off because uh, you know the in 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 an aluminum housing, if you micro drill some holes, obviously some water could get in. Uh, so they have this micro drilled holes, and they put this little uh, rubber gasket to seal that off, and then they actually tape the uh, LED uh, to make sure that that prevents water from coming in as well. Uh, so there's a couple of ways there. And then you have the, the power button itself, which they use. Uh, it's actually a separate component, which is, oops, sorry, which uh, just has spring contacts. And this, the power button has like, I think a bunch of uh, silicon glue as well in it. So those are the, the five or four or five main areas where water ingress could come in. Um, and they're trying to block that as much as possible. If water does get in, uh, I believe they would probably use some kind of conformal coating over the main PCB so that nothing can be, uh, nothing shorts. And then uh, they 
put extra protection around any power components. So that would be the uh, battery and the power uh, in from the USB lines. But yeah, you want to put on the a battery pouch itself. Um, I think the the pouch itself is actually should be quite sealed. It's it's uh, designed to be sealed. They, they obviously they had to. I think they taped around the the components that would normally be here, so that's probably been sealed a little bit more yeah. uh, than normal. And then uh, this one, I actually, I unfortunately destroyed when I pulled off the this lid. But uh, there was a lot of silicon potting around the connector yeah. there, uh, so I think they were most concerned about that point. Um, another interesting thing in this device is, as I mentioned, with the uh, ambient light sensor, they had to consider the same thing with the Wi-Fi antennas. So if you're holding it this way, uh, and again, you have to put Wi-Fi antennas through the RF clear sections, which is typically on an all-metal device, would be through the glass. Um, so there are two uh, Wi-Fi antennas. One is located in the bottom corner here, and then the upper uh, upper corner here, or I guess if I do it the other way, uh, it'd be here and here. Um, and this is, again, so when you're holding it in this side, this will detune the antenna. So this one will be your primary antenna. And when you hold it this way, the opposite will be true. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, try to get that in the frame. Uh, and so, uh, you know, this, uh, yeah, so these are the, the two antennas. Um, when you have a metal housing so close to your uh, antenna, you also want to prevent uh, certain, I guess, capacitive or inductive effects. So you have some interesting like little spring contacts that you need to add. And because they need to like drill in through this plastic uh, insert into this housing so that it can like contact off on there. So there's some really uh, neat ways that the uh, team actually solved uh, getting like Wi-Fi antennas out of an entirely metal backplane here. Um, or metal device. Uh, this We've is got, the PC hmm? we, got, we got a question here from okay. from Aaron. Uh, did you find any tension between your drop testing and waterproofing? Uh, did you have to make any trade offs between those two goals? Uh, you know, I honestly I didn't work on this product. I worked on previous <laughs> products, but um, I think drop testing and waterproofing would actually <laughs> Uh, kind of go hand in hand in terms of the uh, like getting things kind of glued and sealed more. Um, I think you might find sometimes if you seal too well, and I think Anna and Sam at Instrumental have some challenges with this with like the watch, where if you seal too much, uh, if you go under some kind of pressure, you go like high up in the air, you go like underwater for too much, uh, that the pressure has nowhere to go, right? And so like things, you know, there's no, no, way for air or something else to escape was it changes uh, as pressure changes. Um, but in this instance, I believe the product, uh, the waterproofing aspect of the product actually help with the reliability aspect of it in order to get the, um, the structure to be uh, more tightly sealed. Uh, there may have been some challenges with like the power button being a separate component. Um, sitting down on top of something and the spring contacts may be losing some some spring or maybe being damaged in a in a drop event. Uh, that might that might have been something that they had to had to contend with. Um, yeah, I remember I think I would agree with Chris from my experience as well. In general, waterproofing and drop, uh, most of those most of those design decisions should be moving in the same direction. I do remember some interesting trade-offs on adding in glue to improve drop performance, but then it brings up a whole host of thermal stress concerns because you add in a whole bunch of glue, like let's say to this back of the display, you now have to account for what does this glue do when you heat it up on the on Chris's dashboard desk? You know, does it expand? Um, does it expand, does it contract? Uh, what's the one-time stress? And then what if you cycle that? So I've seen more trade-offs made between thermal and drop performance than um, waterproofing and drop. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
and it's a really interesting insight. Uh, I wanted to highlight the size of the board um, as we talk about a little bit about waste and uh, product improvements. So the first Kindle I really worked on was a Kindle 2. And the entire, um, almost the entire product, which included, included this keyboard, uh, was our PCB, right? The PCB was actually an internal uh, and right. a structural component. This is the board from the Kindle Oasis now, uh, which you know fits in in a smaller area than the keyboard area itself. So uh, a lot of advances have been made <laughs> in the intervening mm -hmm. ten years or so that um, that Amazon's been making these products, uh, and a lot of that has to do with how um, you know, electronics has shrunk so much, like memory and devices and components can now be so small that they're all totally integrated. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think you can put like maybe eight to 10 of these uh, on the same size board as uh, as we used to do for the, the Kindle 2. Um, there's some other interesting things on here, like this This is the modem that we purchased uh, and just stuck onto the, the Kindle before now, I think the modem would sit in this in this section, and it would be like a discrete component as well. And you know, the SIM card we used to use like a regular SIM card, and now you can get like the micro SIMs. Um, and I eventually maybe you could do uh, like the SIMless or the chip, SIM on chip um, to do this. Uh, there's some other interesting things here. You can see there's a bunch of holes in this shield can. And does anyone know what those holes would be for? Are those test points? Nope, I don't think they're test points. I don't know. Uh, so what this probably is, is these are areas where you would introduce BGA underfill. Um, so you oh. would have a needle where you wanted to actually glue the components yeah. down more, right? And I, Kyle, you probably have to had to try and remove some of these things. Oh, in the yeah, pack. we don't like it very much, yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> but likely because this board is so thin uh, and it's like a structural component in this because it is also glued into the main housing, uh, they yeah. were worried about torsional uh, rigidity of the of the board itself yeah. and how it could affect the components. Yeah. So, um, so this is where they would have injected uh, the underfill glue into, yeah. the, into the components. Tobias, do you recall the, the iPhone, like the 6 Plus, the, with the Touch IC? Sent, uh, uh, so the Touch IC was at a flex point where there was like a SIM card, and so you had your phone in your back pocket, and you would just pop the, the chip off the board. We called it touch disease. <laughs> <laughs> Impacted millions and millions of iPhones. Yeah, I remember... I, I don't remember holes in shield cans. I remember, uh, I remember doing DOEs on. I, I don't. Rem I don't remember which flex it was, but we would dispense the underfill at the corner of the shield can, and it would wet underneath the shield yeah. can to the rest yeah. of the components there. So we do a bunch of experience about like the different viscosity <laughs> of these <laughs> these underfills. Like, is it going to make it through the shield can? But that one definitely looks uh, large enough that it makes sense that you might need some holes to underfill those. Yeah. <laughs> so, Chris, I'm curious about this board. Um, I mean, in 10 years, it's gotten an eighth the size. Do you think that'll happen again? Like, when I think back to the Apple Watch, the boards got so small that the biggest things on the board were the screws trying to hold it down. <laughs> and that's in a watch where the screws are, you know, M1, M.8, you know, the smallest screws you can imagine. Do you think they can do another 8X shrinking in size of that board over the next five, 10 years? I think anything is possible. I, you know, the, the biggest advances in the board size has been the integration of all the components into like system on chips. So you're, you're really talking about, uh, I think there's maybe four main BGAs now, like where's the old one we used to have to integrate, you know, a touch control or like a, you know, display controller, then you'd have your memory, then you'd have your power, you'd have other things. A lot of these, uh, like the main CPU, actually, the, I think the E-Ink controller had its own thing. Uh, and now they've kind of integrated them all into single components. And uh, as we speak, I'm sure Apple and other companies like Qualcomm are developing uh, chips that are completely integrated. You buy the just the chip itself. So I think it's possible to get down a, a little bit from this. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think if you go to a, a SIM on a chip, 
you don't need this much space to, to leave aside. If the radio becomes integrated into the, the main uh, CPU, then, then that shrinks. Um, you know, if the battery architecture, the power architecture becomes part of the main CPU, that can also become something a little bit smaller. But, um, you know, I think uh, an eighth the size of this would be quite a feat, and I would love to see that. But, um, but I think that could something... be a single SOC, right? You could yes. have an SOC. It would have to get down to a single that. SOC, and and then you're talking about the sub nanometer kind of uh, fab that would need to exist. Um, you know, they're down at five nanometers now. Maybe they can get down to to two nanometers or or whatever the next one beyond nanometers is. Um, but there's still going to be needs for like traces for power and display. Um, so, so these things will take up room. And as you mentioned, like the screws uh, are going to take up a lot more room than mechanical features, um, unless you go with glue or tape or something else to, to, to hold things in place. Um, one other thing I think I forgot to mention about this housing is this is an aluminum, I think it's a stamp forged or kind of drawn aluminum housing to get this uh, bump feature out. But to create all the the structure in there for where things get adhered to, this is actually, uh, I think it's nano molded, which means that they etched the aluminum down with a chemical bath, and then they injection molded plastic resin over it. And the, the small micro etching actually allows the uh, plastic to adhere tighter to the metal than it would to itself. So, so it's a much stronger way of bonding plastic to metal. Um, and, uh, but you still see there's a, a, a huge number of like conductive points that they had to make uh, uh, for touching off on the board, again, for grounding, for antenna purposes. Uh, they had to etch off certain areas, like this is where that copper tape strip we talked about earlier was. Uh, they had to make uh, points, and there was like a special screw that actually has to screw through this plastic and touch off onto the metal component for the antenna because, again, that's capacitive, uh, capacitive effects. Um, so, you know, even when you think you can get something that's, uh, that's uh, near net shape or completely net shape, you still need to make accommodations for some of those electrical components as well. So that, that's, a, you know, I think they did a really good job here, but it's, you know, it does add cost and time to put all these little components in there um, to make it, uh, touch off and and you have to make sure that these sit a little bit higher than than this so they can spring in there and have enough conductivity uh, to make that uh, to make that grounding connection. Uh, one last, uh, I think this is more like an Easter egg. There's a little I don't know if you can see it here. There's a little drawing of a snifter glass here. If you can see that. <laughs> so this product, uh, I think the code name for this product was actually cognac. Um, so for some reason, the, the Kindle uh, nicknames uh, or project names got onto um, alcohols at one point. And so we had, you know, like, I think tequila, ice wine, um, Pinot, and this one was cognac. So uh, it looks like they, they let that one continue on and make it into production with the little icon there, um, which is kind of fun. It's a, it was a good thing to see. Um, but Chris, yeah, I got I got one last question for you. Sure. Um, so we didn't get to see you taking all the screws out, but it didn't seem like there were that many. Uh, on the other hand, you mentioned silicone glue, conductive glue, copper tape, display tape, uh, ceiling foam around the connectors, battery tapes. Um, I mean, there's just so many different kinds of adhesives in this product. How did that? How does that change your job as an engineer when you were doing this, you know, the first or second generation of the Kindle versus a product like this? Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, Kyle, when we were building things, I'll talk to Kyle because he's a big fan of glues, not screw, uh, screws. Not screws. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan of screws, too. I love screws. Um, but uh, they do take up a lot more room. You need um, both in X and Y, just the heads. I, I actually worked on a product. I remember where we made the heads so thin that we, we would go to screw them down and the heads would break off because we were exerting just enough torque beyond their actual limit. We also had to like go to a harder screw. Um, and I think it's, it's a challenge. I think it's a very 
interesting challenge. Uh, I, I do think Apple actually has set the bar very high in terms of no, no visible screws or you only have the two um, and people are trying to emulate that. And one of the easiest way to, to put things together uh, with that constraint is to glue them together. Now, one of the hardest things to do is to take those things apart once, once, once they yep. are glued together. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that there is some better way of adhering things together at the same time, you know, we are asking a lot more of these components to serve double, maybe even triple duty, uh, now, right. Your, your display can't just be a display. It's also the touch screen, the light, the, you know, battery, I don't know, it's not the battery, but it's like the, the buttons. Uh, and then it also has to serve as a structural element. And the only way to kind of do that right now is to to integrate these things with some kind of adhesive um, and there are good reasons to use all kinds of different adhesive because um, you 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 will find that you'll need to make some kind of grounding connection to use that conductive adhesive you'll need some kind of compliant adhesive to do things so it's it's challenge it's a challenge to to try and do this well and i think it's you know i always had a saying which is like it's very easy to make bad products Right. It's very easy to just slap something in there and glue it in and just forget about it. Uh, and you know what they pay Amazon and Apple and Facebook and, and Google engineers to do is to really try and get in there and figure out how you can uh, get that same structure without resorting to uh, the sort of the easy, quick way out, which is which is just the glue. But yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I see the the future where we can get that same structure in this as thin and small a space. Um, and so well, maybe you know, it doesn't have to be that thin. It's, it's, that's, a, that's, you know, that, I think, uh, that's, that's a argument to make to the people. I, so um, I've got a Fairphone here. This is the Fairphone three, I think. And I've uh -huh. got a pixel. Uh, so this is a new pixel in a case and it, it, you know, they're basically the same. Um, and yeah. this has a removable battery and this one doesn't. So. Yeah. I've got, yeah, I've got one wrap-up question actually for Kyle. Um, I just quiz because we didn't get enough time for questions uh, before. What what is the most exciting uh, repairability trend that that you're seeing? Like, what are you most yeah. excited about in this whole movement that that you're working towards, like in the next year or two? The French scoring system is changing everything. So all of a sudden. Like Samsung just posted the service manual for their Galaxy Note devices and uh, started selling service parts um, directly to consumers in France. That's awesome. Um, uh, you've got Google just posted the repairability score. If you're in France trying to buy a Pixel, it shows the repairability score as you're checking out. So um, that's that's what we're and that's then you know starting to get to the marketing, starting to get to the marketing will tell design, okay, you can have an extra half a millimeter if it's going to mean a better score. Got yeah. it. Yeah, that, that'll be really like, interesting. We're turning the corner here where it, for, uh, for a long time, I have been old man shakes hand at Sky. Uh, I think I think we're getting better. Uh, That's well, exciting. I have one last question for you, Kyle. How would you rate Chris's teardown today? Hey, this is great. <laughs> On a but scale you didn't of break one to all ten. of them. <laughs> if you designed it, I would expect you'd know how to open it without breaking it. <laughs> Uh, I have a, a lot more uh, experience now for the second one if you need some help, but uh, <laughs> there's uh, a section of adhesive that you will need to do uh, with the IO pair probably for yeah. 20 minutes. That's okay. Something. We break a lot of things too. We hide them in the teardown. Sometimes you look at the look at the LCD like very close to the teardown and you'll see that <laughs> hairline crack. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, for everyone still here, uh, I think we're wrapping up shortly, so feel free to to hop out whenever. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. We can hang out here for a couple more minutes. Yeah. For for any other uh, for any other questions with uh, the teardown expert Kyle or or Chris from Amazon. Chris, really great job. This is super fun, and it's always like I would have never guessed in a million years that that was PGA under Phil. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you guys, uh, just random question, Kyle, uh, I know you said heat is, uh, in your experience, the best way to combat some of these adhesives. Um, I remember specifically on some sub modules, we had tried extremely cold temperatures as well. Yeah. 
Have you yeah. had any success yeah, we'll uh, when that. you're opening up products? Have you had any scenarios where cold actually worked better than hot? I've been told this is how Daisy works. Uh, Daisy's Apple's new death bot that killed mm, my yeah. Uh, to, yeah. So you can imagine. So I mean, you know, throw it in the freezer and then smack, right? right. Uh, so a sharp. Uh, yeah, I mean that potentially can work. We'll we'll use like hot uh, the the compressed air, flip it upside down, and you can use that to. Um, with the one plus, uh, we did that, and I mean, because we tried everything. We tried heat. It was interesting. We had two different one plus units. One of them came apart like a dream. No, one plus essential. This uh, the essential fun. One of the yeah. essential fun came came apart fine, and the other one it, it was it was completely impervious to heat, so we had to use cold. Um, I'm sure they had some inconsistencies. <laughs> they really struggled on the manufacturing side. They had, yeah, they had a lot of challenges. I have stories I can tell another time. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever happened to the the OnePlus phone? It looked like a pretty cool phone, but I haven't heard much about it recently. Yeah, I don't know about the new one. Um, like, but, what so the, the news today? And the reason I got them mixed up is OnePlus or the founder of OnePlus just bought Essential. Or whatever's left. <laughs> oh, really? Huh. Nice. The, the brand right, may be well, coming back. As we're wrapping up here, one last one last uh, shout out to the audience here. If you have any questions now, it's kind of open floor. So just throw them in the session chat. And Kyle, Chris, Tobias, or I, we'll do our best. I'm going to share one last thing while we're waiting for people to to. Uh, come back, I forgot to do this, but this is, a, I have a, a microscope, just a, one of those cheap USB microscopes, just to show you the difference between the EA screen, uh, and this is on the original Kindle, and like an LCD, which yeah. you can see all the micro sub pixels. Yeah. Um, so much better. Through. Yeah. Uh, it, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, you can, you can actually see you know how poor the display resolution was before <laughs> the original ones, because you can kind of see where the where the um, if I if I highlight it here, um, you know where each line and trace is kind of going across. But you can't really see through it because each of these is a micro capsule, uh, and so that it's actually filled with a, a like a bistable material. And when I move to the Kindle Oasis, you can see it's a much smoother and cleaner line, but you also have uh, actually several layers in front of this. So you actually have the front light layer, you have the touch screen, and you have the cover lens. Uh, and so one of the reasons, you know, we, we were talking about this earlier, the display used to be just right in the front. And now it's like three or four layers down. And one of the reasons that Amazon went uh, to this is, well, to make the uh, cosmetics and the, the form look better. But the reason they were OK with it was because the resolution of the display had actually gotten uh, much higher. So when they went from uh, 167 PPI to 212, and then ultimately to 300, uh, they felt that, that was, this was enough of a, a resolution bump that people wouldn't notice the difference. 